Welcome to Cause of Craft. I'm your host, John Tilton. Why do we create? Where do our ideas come from? What does our craft say about us? These are the ideas we explore here on the show. Each episode, I interview a different guest, from writers and painters to musicians and filmmakers. Together, we investigate the creative process and the reasons behind why we create. It's everyone's dream to have a job that doesn't feel like work, but sometimes there are hidden pitfalls that come with that. Our guest, Rob Crackle, shares with us his love for sound design and talks about how overextending ourselves can take a toll over time. We also discuss his creative process, how Ben Burt inspired him as a kid, and advice for new creatives. Also, a reminder that if you like this podcast, the best way to help it grow is to share with a friend. And I've heard a rumor that if you share with two friends, Christmas will come twice this year, but that might just be superstitious. In any case, I hope you enjoy this conversation. Welcome to the show, Rob. It's good to have you. Thanks for having me, John. So you've been in the audio industry for some time now. What are some of the projects that you've been involved with over the years? Oh, man. Over the years, I've been very fortunate to be involved in um, what some consider some of the you know best games ever. So uh, the Uncharted series, Uncharted 3, Uncharted 4, The Lost Legacy, um, The Last of Us Part 1 and Part 2 as well as a number of like short films with the Film Riot crew. Um, it's been a fun ride. There's been lots of variety. Uh, but I think what people would probably most know my work from is, is the, the video games I mentioned. And what first drew you to sound design? See, I think when I was a kid, I think when we're all kids, we're drawn to sound. And for me personally, um, watching the Star Wars films, and, and this is sort of a common story that a lot of sound designers um, uses a touchstone. There's just something magical about those movies in particular. And I remember very distinctly <laughs> saving up corn pops, uh, box tops. This is back when, when that was a thing and sending them away to get a behind the scenes VHS tape of star Wars and contained on that tape was, you know, lots of the special effects and the costumes and all that good stuff. But there was a small section on sound and they had Ben Burt, who is, you know, the famous kind of sound designer, sound creator of almost all the iconic sounds of Star Wars, the lightsaber, the blaster, Chewbacca, R2-D2, I can go on. But I remember seeing Ben Burt banging on a guy wire with a wrench. And the sound that happened was the sound of the blaster. And it, it just blew my mind that the sound of the blaster was made with something that was completely not the thing that it was. It was just it was like this mind blowing window into the creative process that I didn't really understand what I was seeing because I was a kid. But, you know, now that I think back on it, it was it was highly informative in sort of guiding me to, to sound. When I went to school, I went to the Savannah College of Art and Design and I went there originally because I thought, you know, Pixar had just really started churning out some some of their greatest movies. I was like, I really want to be an animator. That just seems like it's an expanding market. It seems like it would be really fun. It seems like it's right up to my, my alley of, of what I'd like to do. When I got to school, though, uh, it was kind of like a big fish in a small pond syndrome. Like I was a good artist when I was in my hometown. Um, but as soon as I got there, I was like, mm, not as good as all these other folks. <laughs> and so um, my freshman year, once I was able to take some uh, some electives, there was two electives in particular that I was was interested in. One was game design because um, I've always I played games since I was a kid. I, I come from a, a family of gamers. My dad played games. My mom played played games. Even my grandmother had an NES and played Mario and Zelda and Star Tropics and all these things. Um, so I was always interested in games. So I, I was like, all right, I'll take intro to game design. That sounds good. But then there was this other course, intro to sound design. And that little memory in the back of my head of the the guy wire being hit and Ben Burt just kind of like triggered. And I was like, oh, I forgot that that's like a job that you can do. And I, I'm i really curious about it. And so I, I took that as well. And kind of the combination of those two things, I sort of found what I wanted to do, which was to do sound design for video games. When I took that intro to sound design course, there's something magic that happens when you sync your first sound. So you're watching a video and you slide a, a sound effect down the timeline and all of a sudden it it just matches up perfectly with the visuals. It creates this like dopamine hit. It's like almost a game in and of itself, creating that thing and making it sound right. 
Um, and I just got addicted to it just based on those first couple lessons of being able to play with the tools and sounds. And it just sort of set me on this path of discovering what it was all about. But that, that first little taste was really kind of the, uh, the impetus to the, uh, the career that I've had. Something stood out to me in your answer there when you talked about you went to Savannah to pursue animation and you had kind of a creative background. Were you playing around with animation or were you doing other arts in high school, middle school, in your early days that drew you to a creative career? Oh, absolutely. I mean, my my entire family is pretty creative. My grandmother on my mom's side actually was a children's book illustrator. And uh, my mom always had these copies of this book um, for us to look at. And she was very artistically inclined. My mom also, although she would deny it, is very crafty and extremely like artistically inclined to the point of like, she just doesn't think about it, but she can like draw a perfect picture of Santa Claus and like do all these things that most people like struggle to draw a stick figure and she'll draw, she'll render something that is pretty impressive for somebody who's not trying very hard. So I was always encouraged to to draw. My mom, the best thing about going out to eat was my mom always brought a pencil or a pen and we would go to the diner and we'd flip over the paper uh, placemat they'd give you and I would just draw like every night. So I was always interested in drawing. Big comic book fan. Actually was, this, this is going to sound like pretentious in a way, but I was like very into anime before it was like, <laughs> very into like the United States. Like it wasn't in a part of the pop culture zeitgeist at that point. It was sort of like the weird section in the back of the video store or on the sci-fi channel on Saturday mornings, they would have Saturday morning anime and you'd get like Eerie Zerum or you'd get Akira or Vampire Hunter D you'd get this Ninja Scroll, some of these older um, great animes. And those um, definitely influenced me as well. But um in high school, it was was all about doing art, but that was when I sort of, as I said before, I've always been a gamer and something came out, a game came out during high school, which was uh, Half-Life and Half-Life and Quake before it and many other games were uh, known for their mods. And so I actually got really into the modding scene. You could for Half-Life, you could just download their level editor and start making stuff. Um, which was really cool. And I got involved in a few mods here and there doing texture art. I would make my own textures for Counter-Strike or for um, any of the Half-Life. So I would redo the the visuals to some of the characters. I was trying to learn how to animate. I didn't have Maya or 3D Studio Max or anything like that. I was literally trying to use the, I don't even re remember the name of the software at the time, but the crude tools that I had access to. But I, I definitely had an inclination to, to go that direction. But it was still games related, which is funny to where I ended up. Makes sense. But um, yeah, so that was sort of what I was getting into towards the end of high school, where I was actually working on that kind of stuff, making textures and uh, making models and working on mods. And that sort of led me to to the path of wanting to be in animation and wanting to work for Pixar, but definitely influencing the ultimate decision to work on games. It's interesting listening to you talk about taking the tools in the game to make your own thing and using what you have to make something. I think that's a big creative theme that I hear talking to different people on this podcast. And I also wonder if there's a connection there between, you know, you mentioned Ben Burt using something that you would never expect to be a Star Wars laser blaster. But lo and behold, that's what creates the sound. And I wonder if some of if there's some connection there between you going out into the field and finding all these different sounds and then bringing them back and mixing them together in creative ways. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, that, that is sort of, once you sort of get into what sound design and sound editing actually is, is you are building sounds for things that don't exist and they have to start from somewhere. And there's, you know, various sort of schools of thought on, on what those things should be, should be or what they should sound like. I was always a fan of sort of the Ben Burt style, um, which was using organic real world recordings. You know, at the time Star Wars came out, synthesizers were very popular and, and a lot of science fiction movies around that time, you know, people would pull up a bank of synthesizer sounds and they'd play them on a keyboard and there would be your lasers and there would be all your, your uh, science fiction based sounds. And um, there's sort of like, 
a disconnect from the believability of of making it from a real thing. And that's where you get like these blasters being made from these guy wires and and Chewbacca's voice being made from a bear and, and multiple other creatures like that, that thought process of making things from things that exist and reappropriating them and then setting them to the picture to where they feel right. There's definitely just a, a mindset, I think, um, that you come to where you're you're making do with what you have and then trying to think creatively within those boundaries. So when you're collecting sounds from nature to create, you know, new sounds or repurposed sounds that you're finding, are you collecting those all yourself? Is there a library of sounds or is there the the Rob Crackle drive of sounds and it's, you know, <laughs> sounds that are unique to you? Or is it, oh, we have Uncharted 3 has particular sounds that we collected just for that game. How does all that work? So that is it, all of the above. There are commercially available libraries. Um, when I started, there were some fairly famous ones. Sound Ideas and Hollywood Edge were two of the bigger libraries that were available at the time. But um, they're sort of these general libraries where they have lots of different types of sounds that can cover many different things. So they'll have cars, they'll have animals, they'll have footsteps, they'll have a variety of things, but they're not always specifically tailored to what you're trying to make. So often what happens and often what we would do is utilize those as a starting place. We'd figure out what we really need and then we would go record a lot of the things ourselves. Um, so for Uncharted 3, we recorded a lot of whooshes and impacts and debris and other things on our own based on what we knew we needed, the visuals we were trying to connect with, the gameplay elements that we were trying to support. We knew that we needed some specific stuff, but that is almost always mixed with something that we um, have in a library somewhere. But every sound person probably, I would hope, uh, has some kind of personal library. I'm always recording. I have a recorder in literally every room of my house and in my car. And the beauty of the, our cell phones these days, they are also recorders. So if worse comes to worse, you've always got that. So if you come across an interesting sound, um, there's kind of no excuse not to not to record it and, and stick it in your library because you never know. I find the the sounds that we record on our own, the sounds I've recorded specifically like that, like I even recorded on my honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> um, they go into my mental catalog way better. I, I like know those sounds. I have a specific memory associated with them, so they're easier to recall. Whereas, you know, a big commercial library, like I said, has lots of different things, but I don't necessarily like have an immediate recall to all of those things. It's pleasurable as well. Like it's really fun to find sounds out in the out in the world and then think about what the possibilities are for them. It's always like a really fun activity. It's like, yes, it's work. Yes, you you need it as part of your job, but it's also like a really creatively stimulating activity, I find. So are you just always listening for this? Is it second nature where something that you haven't heard before, something that you're hearing in a new way just stands out on its own? Or do you have to think about that? It's a curse, John. It's a curse. <laughs> Sound folks will tell you they're always listening. They are always hearing things that other people are, you know, most people's brains are really good at tuning out background noise and things that are not important, focusing on voices and things that are important. But sound folks uh, tend to have ears that are open to much wider to the background flora and fauna that are around them because there is that off chance like, oh, that's the perfect sound for X thing that I've been thinking about. Or, oh, that's a really interesting door squeak. Like you, I can be having a conversation with my wife at, at, uh, at a restaurant and literally hear the door open and be like, oh man, that's a really interesting door. I should probably try to record that. <laughs> um, it, it is it is a curse in a way because um, you're not ignoring a, as much of the background noise as you might otherwise. But um, like I said before, it's it's a pleasurable activity to record and to have a mental catalog of those things. And it's something that is always fun. I've never found it not fun to go out record sound effects. And is that something where then when you're playing the final product, if you're working on a game or watching a final movie, are you watching that and hearing the door open and thinking of the date that you're on with your wife or is, or is the sound then so completely different that it's, it doesn't recall those specific memories? 
I, I would say probably both, depending on what the sound is. I mean, there are certain things like a squeak or a ronk or something that you record that you then layer into other sounds to create something new. Um, but that there can be things specifically like that, that you that you record the the thing that it is. A great example of this, and this isn't something I recorded. This is something uh, one of my coworkers at the time, uh, Mike Niederquell, recorded. At the end of The Last of Us, you are carrying Ellie and you go into an elevator and you go down to the parking garage. The sound of that elevator, the travel of it, the door, the ding, the whole thing, the whole performance of that elevator is the elevator at Naughty Dog that goes down to the parking garage. <laughs> and so Mike recorded it start to finish and it was like just the right length because it was the same amount of floors. Like it's perfectly the right elevator. Now, most people are not going to think or care that it was recorded at Naughty Dog, but I always remember that because I remember Mike putting it in the game and, and listening to it and going, oh, that's the elevator. Awesome. Like it's uh, it's a it's like an inside joke, but it's sort of like a, a, a little inside knowledge that uh, makes it a little more special because it is a specific recording that was for a specific need that is totally custom to that project. That is also something that I'm super familiar with. So that stands out, especially since it has a story behind it. But I'm thinking for the player, they're experiencing that and they're just thinking, oh, it's an elevator. That makes sense. The noise makes sense. Um, they're probably not thinking, oh, wow, this noise of the elevator, you know, versus, you know, if there's a zombie or something like that, they might be mm -hmm. more intrigued by the sound that's coming out. It feels like the zombies are obvious for the one category and the elevator is more of a mundane thing. Yeah. Do you feel like there's ever a struggle to find that balance between giving something a noise that really makes it stand out and something that should be blending into the background? That uh, focus is what you're talking about. And focus is always something that is a creative conversation with the director uh, of the game or of the film, uh, if the case may be. I find that over the years, like my personal sort of inclination or, or uh, thought process is usually pretty close to the types of games that I've gotten to work on and the people I've gotten to work with, uh, I've kind of like dialed in my uh, thought process to match their expectations. But I think sound folks can often, depending on what you're working on, uh, especially if you're on a, a big team of people, it can feel like whatever you're working on is the most important thing. And sometimes you can put a little more effort and, and design and maybe a little over design the thing and it grabs too much attention. That's that's often something as as younger sound designers, like I did this myself, um, moving up. You think that every sound is important. And every every sound must be the best sound ever. But you know, as you as you kind of go through your career, uh, specifically for me, I've realized more and more that it's more about the whole. Right, the the sonic landscape that we are creating needs to be consistent and make sense. And the things that are important need to stand out. And the things that aren't important need to be there, but not necessarily call attention to themselves. And it's always a delicate dance because you want people to be excited about their work, but also you want them to understand the context of, of what exactly it is they're making. Um, so it can always be an interesting conversation uh, trying to deal with that expectation of every sound is important versus the reality of Every sound is important in that it must be done, but it's not necessarily important in that it must be the best sounding thing ever. Do you ever find yourself stuck getting the right sound for something? And if you do, what do you do to try to get unstuck? I think absolutely. Uh, it, it, you know, there are certain things that are relatively easy, like, you know, if we're talking about door elevator, we know what those things sound like. So it's more of a selection process. You're just trying to find the right one of those things as opposed to just trying to figure out what that thing sounds like. Now, things that are more subjective, and you can go to creatures or explosions or planes falling out of the sky, whatever it is, there's not necessarily an accurate recording of those things ready to go. Um, and so trying to figure out exactly what those things sound like can be challenging. I'm very much like, I don't like a blank canvas. I will, I will just put something down, even if it's wrong, just to make sure that I'm going. That is sort of how I operate. And with sounds, especially when you're creating creatures or uh, bigger sort of events of lots of noises going on. So for a plane exploding or something like that, just layering in some things that make sense or that hit some of those sync points to where it's like, oh, 
if I'm creating a creature, I can see the teeth gnashing. If I put something in that's close to what those teeth gnashing might be, and I can fill in sort of around it with vocalizations of different animals or whatever, if I find a few points that I can actually hit that feel right, uh, that helps the sort of creative juices get flowing. Um, but I, re I really am like, you know, I, writers sort of have like the, the empty page thing. It's like, just start writing, even if it's totally wrong. It's the same for sound. Like if you have an empty track, just start putting stuff in. If it's totally wrong, you, you can replace it and come back to it. But you may find that, or I found once I start playing and trying to have fun with it, that can be kind of the best way to get out of that funk of trying to figure out what something sounds like. It's like, don't be concerned with what the end product is. Just throw some things in that make sense for whatever it is you're trying to make. And you'll eventually find out sort of through a process of discovery what it wants to sound like. Yeah, before you even brought the example of writing up, that's exactly what I was thinking of from my own experience where when I'm writing something, I will like put things in brackets and then just keep going. And I used to, when I first started writing, think, oh, I need to get this right before I move on. But like you said, that experience kind of teaches you that, oh, if, if you do that, it's going to be a while before you get anywhere. And a lot of times when I'll, again, when you were mentioning, when you layer in things, you get better ideas about something that you're stuck on. If I keep writing, I might write a scene a couple chapters later that tells me exactly what I should put in that the brackets that I stuck into the document earlier. Right. So yeah, that's, that's cool to hear that connection between two somewhat different things. I mean, the blank canvas is something I think all creative people face in one way or another. It's just sort of the fear of doing something wrong or doing something inconsistent or maybe not what other people expect. I think that sort of fear can prevent a lot of creative works from happening especially if you're working alone on something and you're just starting, like I find that fear to be fairly useful, useless to me. Cause it's like, no one's going to hear this first version. It's fine. Like it can be totally terrible. It will be fine moving on from that. At least there's something on the, on the page, so to speak. Uh, and then we can refine from there, which is always good. And then one of the greatest things ever is working on a team and getting feedback from people people that you trust, people whose uh, opinions and uh, at least in the sound world, whose ears that you trust can be immensely helpful. It takes a little bit of mastering of your own ego to hear creative feedback. But uh, ultimately, I think it's probably one of the most important skills that you can develop over time is understanding that people can give you ideas. You don't necessarily have to take them, but it's it's really great to be able to listen to peer feedback and Sometimes you can get really great nuggets and you can make your work even better. And at the end of the day, it's ultimately still your creative process. It's not like all of a sudden the credit goes to this other person's idea. It's really a collaborative creative experience, especially when you're working on a team. And as I said before, when you're thinking about the soundscape as a whole and you're working uh, with a group trying to keep things consistent, getting feedback from them is paramount to making sure that you're, you're living in that same world. Now, do you specialize specifically in, you'll have the better description, but the Ben Burt style sound, like those types of things, or do you also help oversee how that balances in with the music or how the other, the dialogue and all that gets mixed together in the end? So when I was uh, on The Last of Us Part Two, it was the, the audio lead. So the audio lead is sort of responsible for what I like to say, uh, everything that comes out of the speakers. So dialogue, music, sound effects, and the mix of those elements all together. So absolutely have influence and, and collaboration with folks, uh, with the dialogue crew is, you know, I, there was a great team that I worked with that handled all the creative decisions and the, the mastering and the recording of all the files and the management of that, which is a monumental task in and of itself. But, you know, in some of the systems design, how the, the efforts work or how some of the creatures work, like I had influence on those things, but not necessarily direct hands on because there were great people that were working on those things. But as the audio lead, the, the thing that I did have hands on with was the mix. So that's how all the elements get come together to create sort of the, the soundtrack to the game um, and how loud things are versus how quiet other things are. As far as music goes, that is 
mostly a decision and a conversation between our music team at the Sony PD side of things with Neil Druckmann, who's the creative director on Lots of Us. Um, but I was able to have some influence. There were certain elements that uh, that were clashing or, or uh, creating sort of an odd sound when combined with sound effects that, you know, I worked with the sound t- team and the music team to, to remove and find a better happy middle. I also had my own opinions on exactly how the the sound of the music would ultimately come out. So I was able to share those things. But like I said, it's it's a, cl- a collaboration. It's not a, a dictation. Uh, and ultimately, we're we're there to support what the director wants because it's their, you know, it's Neil's creative vision and his ultimately his story to tell. So it is uh, is very much a, a collaborative experience. Um, but ultimately, you know, the mix, like I said, everything that comes out of the speakers passes through my my hands and my ears. And the hope is when it comes out the other end that um, it supports the story and and helps to inform the gameplay. And so when players are playing it, they don't really think about the audio. Everything just kind of sounds correct and gives them the information they need to play the game effectively. Working in this field for 16 years, what keeps you interested and passionate about the work? There are a lot of things about the creative art of sound design uh, that are extremely fun. Like it's, it's just still, I still get that dopamine hit when I line up the right sound to the picture and it just feels right and it just fits perfectly and you play it back and you're like, yes, of course, that's what it sounds like. There's just something that feels great about that. It's also incredibly fun, as I said before, to go out and record and to find these sounds and to, to take part. More recently, as I've gotten into more of the leadership side of things, getting to build a team and, and lead a group of people uh, on a project like Last of, Last of Us Part Two was immensely satisfying in a way that I had not experienced before. I really enjoyed the leadership part of the equation. It is a challenge that is individual and different than anything that I've had to deal with before. But I think ultimately a worthy one, and I really, I really found it to be kind of the best part uh, about that. But in terms of the creative work, I think it's still fun after 16 years. Like it's still really fun working in audio. It is just a, it's a fun job. Like it's a really creatively fulfilling job for me that just hits me in all the right places to make me feel accomplished and creatively satisfied. And so with all the joy and and excitement and you're talking about the leadership roles that you've had recently with all of that, you've still also decided to take a step away from at least a certain aspect of it. What led you to those decisions? And can you talk a little bit about that? So working in audio for 16 years and specifically at Naughty Dog for the last 11 years, it's incredibly hard to make these things. Uh, Making video games is one of the most challenging creative endeavors. It, it takes an immense effort by everyone involved. And that effort takes a toll. It's, uh, it's incredibly difficult to make these things. It's incredibly difficult to make kind of anything creative, but video games in particular are, especially at the level of, of Naughty Dog, are um, just really, really challenging uh, physically, mentally. And so I think the amount of hours that, that I was working, you know, kind of my whole career up until that point, um, which are very much, I, I only can blame myself for, right? Like I chose to work all those hours and I absolutely didn't really feel bad about it at the time, but the accumulation over the years sort of basically caught up with me. And so I am taking a little bit of time away. Um, I think, you know, it's probably qualifies a little bit as burnout, creative burnout. But as I said, I, I still love the craft. The craft is amazing. Deadlines and expectations and all that stuff um, are just exhausting to to deal with. And being able to take a step back and focus on family was really the impetus to make sure that my I have two young kids. I have a, a seven-year-old and a four-year-old. And so getting to focus more on them, spend more time with them, limit my hours to something that's reasonable so I can take my daughter to gymnastics or my son to swimming or whatever it is was really important to me. And also like being able to support my wife and, and make sure that she's getting time and, and support to follow her dreams and her career. I think 
all those things combined together to sort of create a, a moment for me where I needed to make a decision to make a change. And so we've made a change and it's still very fresh. John, you're catching me very fresh on this change, <laughs> but so far so good. I don't think I'll ever be able to stay away from sound design though, because I do love it so much and it is it is just a part of who I am and has been. And I don't I don't see that going away. I still I'm literally staring at a recorder right in front of my face. I have a recorder in my car. Like I said, I just recorded something the other day coming back from dropping my son off. So it's I don't think I'll ever get away from it. And um, taking a step away from a big company like Naughty Dog and those big expectations, those huge projects allows for experimenting and trying things new and trying small things and potentially working on smaller projects, smaller games, smaller films and exploring what the the balance that can be achieved uh, in terms of work and life will be like. You talk about the big projects like the games and I'm, I was trying to speculate on what might be a smaller thing that you work on. And it sounds like a game that has a smaller budget also might not have that same type of crunch time because it like what would be the reasons why a smaller game might not feel the same way that a big game did it's really down to scope um the amount of audio that is required for something like the last of us part two um the length of that game alone just the amount that is required just to support it at the basic level is so much but also the expectation of the fidelity of the game, meaning every little nook and cranny, every little thing needs to be covered and have sound on smaller projects or even not even necessarily smaller, but maybe less hyper real projects. So something that's more animation based or cartoon based or science fiction based, there's a little more leeway, a little more playroom to have not so much hyper detail which means you can dial back some of those things that you really go crazy on in, in something like The Last of Us. So what would you suggest to other creatives who are feeling burnout? I think that this is kind of a common trend. I don't know if it's with it's the times and the expectations of, of things, but I've talked to other creatives who have felt burnout in their work, in their creative work specifically. Are there times where you can be in the job and do something to kind of help yourself take a step back, but continue on, or is really taking a, a bigger step back and almost like a reset kind of what you're doing today? Is that almost the best cure for any burnout that someone's feeling? I think it's, it's entirely individual. Um, I know for me along the way, it's not like there was no relief or no effort to manage burnout. Um, you know, vacations and, and spending as much time away as much as you can, having hobbies that are outside for me, like I love playing ice hockey and that was sort of my outlet. Having something along those lines to get away from whatever your headspace is for creating is important. But I think my personal personality is I am I am like when I'm in something, I try to do it to the best of my ability, pedal to the metal. You know, I, I don't want anything to be left unturned or, or, or not good enough in my personal opinion, right? But I think as I've gotten older, letting go of certain things is critical to not burning out for me. Uh, I think that's something that everyone can probably relate to is that there are certain things that you can let go. You may not think you can in the in the time, but finding those elements that you can let go I think is important to not burning out. But as, at a certain point, um, working on such high, high pressure things, being able to step away like this and sort of like make a change, a pretty drastic change is pretty difficult for a lot of people to do. Um, I am just very fortunate that I am in a family situation that allows for me to take this break. You know, my wife being able to support our family and, and, take on the the role of of providing insurance and and you know doing everything that needs to be done is really uh is really the thing that allows for me to sort of like make this the shift where a lot of folks probably don't necessarily have that luxury right you've got bills to pay you've got 
things that need to be taken care of. You can't necessarily just like leave your your chosen career to try to take a break and, and figure it out. So that's why I say it's very individual for, for me. It's it is what it is, but um, it's hard to really frame that as advice to anybody. Something that you said about that burnout process stuck out to me in terms of wanting to do it to the best of your ability. And I think that might be some of the connective tissue between these different creatives I've talked to who have felt some sort of burnt out because we're so passionate about what we're creating. Because in creative work, there's there's not as many days where you're clocking in and clocking out and just, you know, filling in the spreadsheet, so to speak, right? Like right. you kind of need to put your full self into it. And that toll adds up, especially you know, thinking about the games industry and there being the crunch time before the game releases and you're, you're still putting your whole self into it just on a higher scale. And yeah, it, it's interesting. You mentioned too about knowing how to let go of a few things um, because it's funny because when we got a dog, I actually felt that at the beginning, I was like, oh, no, I'm never going to be able to create anything ever again because I have this dog. <laughs> and of yeah. course, the puppy days kind of are slowing down and I have more time from that in general. But the fact that we have this puppy to take care of now, it's interesting how it works because I have something else, this this added responsibility. You know, it's not the same as having a, a kid, but, you know, another life. We started with a dog too, so I'm very yeah. familiar. <laughs> <It's> a, <laughs> but it was interesting because it almost freed me up in a sense and also made me more disciplined to, to the time that I did have to work. And I did let certain things go. But like we were saying before, it's like, okay, well, here I just have to put some brackets and I'll come back to that later because I don't have time to sit and contemplate this for three hours. I need to move on. And so in a way, it like like letting go a little bit, it didn't actually decrease the quality of my work. It, I think, ended up increasing it. I wasn't like forcing myself to, okay, I've got to give it everything I have. And this is the only thing on my plate to do. So I better I better push myself to get this done. And having that thing outside of myself helped me, I think, to have to be able to actually put a fresher energy in it, uh, if that yeah. makes sense. I feel like I talked in a circle, but. <laughs> no, I, I I follow you. It's it's having other responsibilities outside of just your creative endeavor, just your work, forces you in many ways to prioritize the most important bits. But depending on your personality, you can still get into trouble with staying up very late, pushing beyond your your limits or what's best, ignoring your health, those sort of things. Those are where I personally have gotten into trouble over the years. It's like, I, yeah, I was able to, even when we were working the latest, still manage to spend time with my kids and, and fulfill my responsibilities as a partner. But I absolutely pushed my body way beyond what probably should have been. And I am uh, I'm reaping the consequences of, <laughs> of that uh, now as a 37-year-old man as opposed to when I was in my 20s. Um, our bodies are not as springy <laughs> when you get older. So, uh, the things that I've learned from working in audio in general are that my creativity lies in a very specific place, or at least it's guided me to a very specific place and leaning into it has made certain things that might've felt like work feel like not work which is which is nice um but i also think has bitten me in a way because when something doesn't feel like work but is work that's when i've gotten into trouble um when i really enjoy what i'm working on it's when i don't want to stop and that's something that over time ha has been a struggle of trying to balance really enjoying the job and the create the creative work and not going overboard with the hours of, of time that I put into it. That is, um, that's something I've learned about myself is that if I really enjoy what I'm doing, it's really hard to stop doing it. <laughs> I think that's the other thing to keep in mind about burnout. If you want to be doing something for a sustained amount of time, you kind of have to look out for yourself because it's, it's one thing if you're like, oh, I'm going to take a year of my life and do this thing and then I'm going to go back to doing something else. 
But if you want to have a career in something, you kind of have to set it up so that it's sustainable. Yeah. And I think commercial, large commercial creative endeavors are not necessarily, it doesn't matter where you look, if you're talking about movies or games, they're all still trying to find that balance as mediums, I think. Um, it's still really difficult as a whole, not even just for individuals to, because creating things is really difficult and trying to schedule things around creative people is also super difficult because it's really difficult to say how long something's going to take that requires creative energy. You can have an idea of what it might take, but it might take half as long or it might take double as long. And that creates these time periods where kind of crunch time happens because you you have people who maybe don't have the dog or the kid or whatever who are contemplating the thing, which then takes it make it makes it take longer, which impacts people that are after them in the chain of creativity. And there's there's so much sort of like linked together um, when you're talking about creative works that especially, you know, things like video games and movies and it's a really hard nut to crack. It's a hard problem to solve. Uh, that I don't think anyone quite has come up with great answers for yet. I do think there's a lot of smart people who are thinking about those things that are, you know, trying their hardest. I know uh, when I was in the leadership group, that was something we talked about all the time was trying to figure out how to be better about scheduling, about taking care of people, about making sure that people are not burning out, about how, how to help people manage their time, how to help people not push beyond their limits. Um, that is something that because it's individual, like it's literally based on each person, there's not just this magic. Oh, if we schedule it this way, if we give this piece of advice, if we give this much vacation time, if we, you know, there's no magic bullet that just solves the problem for every individual. Um, and that's one of the things that makes it so difficult to find the real solutions to fix those things. Yeah. It sounds like any complicated problem in life too, right? It's everyone wants the easy answer, but it turns out that things are complex and it's, you know, like even what you're saying about avoiding your advice to avoiding burnout is all informed from your own experience and what you have the ability to do. And it's not necessarily something that someone can just apply to their own life. It's, it's really almost like the, the central advice is to consider why you feel burnt out and look at your entire scenario and try to piece together what makes sense for you. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So for people who are looking to get into audio design or really just creative careers in general, do you have any advice for what a good step to take would be or just the right mindset to be in in order to pursue something like that? My advice for, for folks who want to get into audio in particular is, 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 a few things uh, simply is to start listening critically. And so that means to media you enjoy, whether it's movies, whether it's games or podcasts or um, anything that it is that you consume regularly, rather than listening to it for entertainment, listen to it critically, analyze, examine your own emotions as you're listening to certain things and try to understand how the sound or the music is affecting you. Um, Because ultimately, sound and music are extremely evocative to human emotion. And so we can control how people feel to a certain extent by using sound. It really helps when you're doing that creative work to have a window into how it's worked successfully elsewhere. Um, There are great films. There are many. I'm not going to give you a list now, but um, there are a great many films that use sound extremely successfully to evoke emotion. So listen critically, examine yourself, make notes, and do your best to try to understand how and why those things are working. From a practical standpoint, I'm a big fan of formal education. I know it's sort of out of vogue these days. Most folks want to learn through Skillshare or on the internet or on YouTube. I think there's a place for that. I think that's great for learning small skills here and there. But I do think my time with formal education was not just learning how to use a microphone or a preamp or anything like that. It was actually working with people directly, uh, creative collaboration. You can do a lot of that outside of school, but um, there's something about doing that while also having to grow up and be an adult and handle all your other stuff, uh, pay your own bills, make sure you're waking up for classes, all that, all that grown up 
stuff that you sort of have a safe space to screw up and make mistakes in. Um, I find the mixture of all that together is was fairly magical for me. And I, so I, I still am a fan of, of formal education in a way, especially if you know the thing you want to do. So if you're really interested in audio or animation or writing or whatever it is, I think there's a lot of benefit to, to seeking that out. I think if you're searching for what you want to do, maybe go to YouTube and start fooling around and figuring it out before you spend the money, invest the time, do all that stuff. But uh, I think in general, there's some magic that I feel like gets lost a little bit when you don't necessarily have that experience down the line. Well, great. Well, thanks so much, Rob. I really appreciate your time and coming on the show, and I really enjoyed our discussion. Thanks so much. John, it was awesome to catch up. It was really great to talk to you. It was a wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for having me. And is there a place that you want to direct people to see any of your work or learn more about you? Honestly, the best place is just on Twitter. Uh, that's where I'm most easily accessible. Uh, anything that I'm, I've got going on will be there. It's at Rob Kreckel, R-O-B-K-R-E-K-E-L. Well, great. Thanks again, Rob. Thanks for listening to this episode of Cause of Craft. You can follow Rob on Twitter at Rob Kreckel, R-O-B-K-R-E-K-E-L. And as always, you can follow the show on Instagram at Cause of Craft. If you enjoyed hearing perspectives on creative burnout, I highly recommend also checking out episode 10 with author K.A. Emmons. She shares some great tips for how to combat the burnout creatives feel from social media and other factors. And as always, if you want to help the show grow, please consider sharing with a friend and leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. For feedback, suggestions, or guest recommendations, send an email to john at causeofcraft.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.